welcome to MITRE's Grand Challenges Power Hour, the uh, specter of quantum winter. Um, the hype surrounding quantum technologies in general and uh, quantum computing in particular has reached a fairly feverish pitch. Uh, a recent survey of decision-making leaders uh, at large global uh, corporations indicated that about 74% of those enterprises have adopted or plan to adopt quantum computing. And over 80% believe that the quantum computing is going to give them a competitive advantage within just the next five years. Unfortunately, if that advantage fails to materialize, well, there's some concern that we'll experience what is referred to as a quantum winter, in which the investment will disappear, enthusiasm will plummet, opening doors to other nations to take the lead in the race for quantum technologies. Uh, so among those topics today, we're going to examine how and what that might happen if this quantum advantage doesn't materialize on that timescales. Uh, by bringing together experts across the government, industry, and academia to speak on the impacts to our economy, Global, com uh, global competition, the national defense, uh, and others. Um, before we begin, uh, we're going to have a keynote speaker followed by a panel. Before we begin, just want to put in a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, uh, this event is actually open to the public and open to the press, so please keep that in mind when commenting in the chat and posting questions to our speakers, uh, particularly with any proprietary or other sensitive information. Uh, if you're interested more broadly in helping us solve some of these big challenges, we'd love to hear from you. And MITRE is, in fact, hiring uh, in this and many other areas. Uh, you can reach us, reach out to us at recruiting help, all one word, recruiting help at MITRE.org uh, for more information. And then lastly, we're going to have a link with information about each one of our speakers today. Uh, we'll be in the chat, and we look forward to a very robust and, and engaging conversation. So please put any questions that you have into the chat. We'll be moderating them uh, throughout the discussion uh, as appropriate. So without any further ado, let me introduce our keynote, uh, Dr. Seeler Metzbacher. Uh, Dr. Metzbacher is presently the Executive Director of the Quantum Economic Development uh, Consortium, uh, frequently referred to as QEC, QEDC, uh, which is a global consortium of uh, over 250 stakeholders from industry, academia, and government that aims to grow the quantum industry and its associated supply chain uh, for the better of both our national security and our economy. Uh, before that, uh, she was the vice president for the Innovative Partnerships at the Semiconductor Research Corporation, which is, of course, a, a consortium within the semiconductor industry. Uh, and from 2003 to 2008, she was the assistant director for technology research and development at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, uh, where she led the uh, National Nanotechnology Initiative. So welcome, Dr. Metzbarger. It's great that you're joining us today. And let me turn the presentation over for your keynote. Thank you, Carl. As uh, Carl said, I'm the executive director of the QEDC. And I'm not going to really spend any time um, talking about QEDC today. I'm really going to talk about the quantum winter question. QEDC, as Carl mentioned, is a consortium of stakeholders from across the quantum ecosystem. We have now... Uh, pushing 250 members, um, and that's from sort of the top of the stack, software companies, even end users, down to companies that make components and critically enabling technologies that go into quantum systems. And we have universities and FFRDCs as members as well. We partner closely with the government agencies. We were really created, in fact, to um, provide channels for industry to inform government, government to inform industry, and so on. Um, so... I feel like I'm sort of sitting in this catbird seat and have a really good eye across the whole community, the global community. So when I was asked to um, give a set of keynote remarks on the topic of the quantum winter, I thought um, I would be happy to share with you my perspective and I'll um, qualify that it is certainly my perspective. QEDC is not a government agency and I certainly don't represent the US government. So um, we have seen winters before. And I went to Wikipedia and found this description of the AI winter. Um, that's one that I think many are familiar with. And when you sort of read about what happened to cause that winter, and in fact, there were, I think some would say multiple AI winters over quite a few decades. It was this chain reaction that was a cascade of um, sort of perspectives and events. First, there was some pessimism in the community itself, and then that sort of trickled out into the, the general press. There were cuts in funding that followed, and ultimately that really uh, caused a decrease in the amount of research. And so that sort of series of events um, is what 
I was thinking I would look for in the quantum space and see if there are any signs that we're maybe approaching a quantum winter. So these are the signs of a winter. The promise is maybe exaggerated. There's a hype at the beginning. And as Carl mentioned, it seems like we're maybe seeing some of that. And I think we're all sensing that. And I have some evidence on um, whether that's the case. And then those expectations aren't being met. Investors pull back. And in the case of quantum, there's even the possibility, I think, that government may actively want to hamper progress. And so I'll talk a little bit about that as well and then give an assessment at the end whether I think there are signs of winter. So what are the signs of hype? Well, um, one that I sometimes jokingly say is the first business that's revenue generating in a new emerging technology area is conference. Uh, event planners and, and people who make money off of conferences. And this is a website that a private individual maintains. I give the link there. Um, he has, I went in today and looked up how many conferences he has listed just for 2023. It's 161 and counting. Um, that's approximately the total number that he listed last year. It's not necessarily a complete list, but it's whatever he is aware of. This is the list just for January of 2023. And um, so that's sort of one indication, certainly, of uh, sort of enthusiasm among the um, technical community because they're getting together and talking about this field actively. And um, another, and I have some sort of fun slides here, sign is how quantum gets sort of embraced as a marketing tool. And so I went online and I found that I'm not endorsing any products and I have no relationship with any of these companies. These were just images I found on the web. Um, but quantum is being stuck on as a label onto all kinds of products from ant bait here on the left and your dishwashing detergent and uh, even paint products at the bottom there. Um, then there are health related um, effects associated with quantum and you can find these um, products, even horse um, uh, extract or something that's helpful for uh, the horse community is uh, being labeled with quantum. So lots of products in the health aisle. Uh, my favorite, perhaps, the quantum spirits that uh, you can buy, apparently. And um, finally, a number of, again, back to sort of health-related aspects, the quantum eye care at the top left, the one on the right here I kind of like, quantum pendant with scalar energy and anti-radiation properties. Uh, sometimes, like the one at the bottom, which is some kind of blood warming device, is just using quantum, you know, as a sort of tech label. Uh, and finally, I think my favorite is the quantum nuke, and you can find this uh, for $700. Apparently, you can have it delivered to whoever you want. Um, so there's a lot of hype that's evident, I guess, because of that, uh, the, the use of the term. Um, but in fact, you know, our expectations being met, I, and now I'll get into the more serious part of the presentation. Um, there's been a lot of promise described in the area of quantum, and uh, companies are in fact reporting progress. And so here are um, some characters that many of you know. We've got Dario Gill on the left, Jay Gambetta in the middle, and Jerry Chow on the right, all IBM um, folks associated with IBM's quantum team. And uh, this is a little bit dated now. It's from uh, November, 2022. Um, unveiling their 400 qubit plus processor, the next generation. So they've published a roadmap or part of their roadmap, and they're marching along it. And so that's uh, showing that, in fact, the expectations are being met uh, and so progress is being made. Similarly, Continuum, which is um, using trapped ions as their qubit uh, technology, in June of last year announced uh, a milestone that they met. And so I would say that on the private sector side, there are um, reports that are encouraging, progress is being made, expectations being met. In the investor world, so now one of the sort of characteristics of the winter were pulling back on the investor side. And I'll talk a little bit first about private investors and then public. So this report just came out this week from McKenzie. It's an update of their quantum tech monitor. And they reported that investments have gone pretty flat in terms of um, the startup investment space. 
So, I mean, it's almost in the noise. They said a 1% increase, but it's pretty flat between 2021 and 2022. Um, and a significant fraction, they report 75%, is towards quantum computing startups. Quantum, of course, has application not only in computing, but in sensing, communication, cybersecurity, and so on. Uh, but the investors are particularly attracted to investments in the quantum computing space, presumably because they see the potential for very large returns in that space. So dollar-wise, it seems a little flat. In terms of the number of deals, those are, in fact, trending down over several years. So the largest number here that they report, and they kind of qualify all of this at the top left here, not exhaustive, but in 2018, they reported 58 startup investment deals. And uh, although there was a little uptick in 21, it seems to be trending down since then. Um, but the dollars are flat. So the size of the individual deals are larger. And, you know, there you can sort of speculate a little bit about why that, what that might mean. Um, and here they say 80% of startups founded in the past three years are in the quantum computing space. So these are, again, McKenzie's um, hypotheses on what's causing this slowdown, um, a lack of talent, possibly, all the sort of really good people are already funded or have, have already um, spun out. And um, so there's a lack of, of people to do startups, um, fewer use cases. So this would speak to perhaps expectations. Um, not being met, and it, and then investors preferring to invest in scale up. Certainly, investors like to minimize risk, and so if there are opportunities to deploy their capital towards something that they think is farther along and more likely to yield um, returns, then they would be attracted to those. So there may be less deals going to the earliest stage ideas. On the government side, um, the National Quantum Initiative reports every year, their budgets, they report, they break them out for three agencies in particular, NIST, NSF, and Department of Energy Office of Science. And those are shown here from the most recent one. So it came out in January and it reports the, as you can see on these um, year over year numbers for up to through 2021, they have actual budget numbers. 2022, because they collected the data during 2022 are estimated. And then the proposed budgets for 23 are included here. So they're not apples to apples between those last three years, uh, columns. And Congress often allocates or appropriates more funding than is requested, especially in these emerging technology areas. So um, if you go back and look at how a proposed budget turned into an estimated budget and then an actual budget over years, uh, often it does increase. But nevertheless, um, if you just sort of eyeball these histograms, um, things are trending up and to the right year over year. That's for these three agencies. Interestingly, they also report in this uh, same document the total amount, and they divide it up according to what they call program component areas. And you can see down here at the bottom, it's sensing, computing, networking, quantum advances. I think that's more sort of broad fundamental work and quantum technology. So they came up with these five categories. Nevertheless, um, when you look at these totals, the total height of the histogram does go down a little bit in 2023. Again, it could increase once we get the actual appropriations. Um, but that sort of is a little bit of a flattening. And these include budget figures from more than just NIST, DOE, and NSF. It also includes other agencies, including DOD, which is a significant funder. So uh, is the government pulling back? Uh, I don't think so. And I, and I don't think they will for a number of reasons. There's both the global competitiveness side, the sort of economic benefit. We want to be the leader in this emerging technology area. And there's a national security side I think most of you are aware of that a sufficiently powerful quantum computer can break encryption. We've known that since the mid 90s when Peter Storr discovered his algorithm and, and published it. And so um, again, there are these sort of national security um, issues that are ensuring or causing the government to 
um, want to make sure that the U.S. remains a leader or the leader. Okay, so budgets have grown mostly. Well, China is the adversary that's sort of out there um, these days. And this is a paper that was, or a report that came out in January. It actually reports on um, delivering a working quantum computer by a company in China to a Chinese customer. But when you go and read these reports, it was um, actually delivered sometime last year in 2022. So China has an active industry as well that's being supported and that government is, is uh, helping to bring forward. And so <clears throat> there's competition out there. And uh, again, this sort of, I think, underpins some of the um, sense that the government investment, the public investment, both in the U.S. and other countries, not just China, but around the world, are likely to continue to be strong. Well, the fact that um, China is aggressively pursuing this technology, and in some areas like quantum networking and communications, they have reported demonstrations of capabilities that could be arguably ahead of the US. Um, meanwhile, our regulators, the export control folks, are considering putting export controls on quantum computing. And this is from a online magazine protocol from last November, um, where it was reported that commerce uh, is contemplating a fresh set of export controls around quantum. Now, there are actually some export controls today that were imposed on Russia and Belarus. And uh, so we could look at those and say, well, what if China was sort of added to the same type of control? Um, there are also, of course, as many of you are aware, uh, controls very targeted controls put on advanced semiconductors last fall. And that's those showed some um, somewhat narrow and, and targeted control approaches that were taken by the Department of Commerce. So those might be a model for what we would expect in the area of quantum computing. QEDC members are actually uh, meeting and discussing industry um, concerns and what uh, impacts might be if certain kinds of controls were placed on the um, on the industry by the unit, U.S. government, and and we're sharing that information with the regulators. So signs of winter: Are we seeing the signs or not? Promise is exaggerated. There's a lot of hype, but um, I think that there's also a lot of credible uh, reporting going on and. It's a very broad set of activities. So um, you, if you're a good consumer of news, you should listen to more than one source. And um, I think that it's not just a matter of um, sort of everyone jumping on a bandwagon. I think there, are, you know, when you get into business, um, it's important to um, be sort of credible. And uh, so while you want to be an optimist and enthusiastic and um, make you know paint as as uh, optimistic a picture as possible in some sense it does need to be um underpinned with reality expectations aren't being met i i put a red x on this one i think expectations so far are generally being met um there's a lot of uncertainty about the timelines and um exactly what use cases are going to emerge and emerge first but um progress is certainly being made and reported investors Pulling back, I don't see that today. Um, there's a flattening on the private side, but um, I think that that isn't necessarily because of um, concerns about the technology. I think that there's still a lot of mismatch between um, traditional venture type investment investors and the timelines of some of these. And also, as we may hear from some of the other speakers today, there are technology needs that are not billion dollar companies they are the sort of enabling technology layer that may create more modest returns and whether those are going to be investments that the um, venture community wants to make or not uh, may be a role for government there as well. And then finally, this idea that government is maybe going to hamper progress through imposition of controls. I think that uh, government needs to be very careful about using export control authorities. You can slow down the adversary, but you can slow down yourself. And so I think that trade-off on protecting and 
at the same time, potentially hampering progress is something that needs to be considered carefully here. So um, QEDC did a survey last year. It was actually a quantum computing market assessment. And you can see that report on the QEDC publications webpage. I just took this because one of the questions at the end of the survey was, so do you think there's going to be a quantum winter? And these are the results. We've done this survey three years in a row now. And so blue bars here were the answers to this question in 2020, orange is 2021, and gray is 2022. So if you sort of step back and eyeball this, it seems that in 2020, the biggest bar was over here, very high chance, highly likely. But there was a distribution of responses. We had about 150 responses. In uh, a year later, 2021, things had shifted more towards the left, the center of mass here. And I haven't done any kind of figure of merit trying to weight average these responses. But the answer is more towards the somewhat unlikely. And in 2022, I would say it's even more so somewhat unlikely. So experts perceive a lower threat of quantum winter um, for what it's worth. It's a sample of people who are pretty embedded in this uh, world. And so I think that's a, another piece of uh, information to consider. So um, this is my test of uh, how many of you are followers of cult movies. But the one thing that we know is that after winter, there's spring, and in the spring, there will be growth. So um, I'll leave it to you all to put in the chat uh, if you know what movie this is from. But uh, that's uh, my sort of thoughts on the subject of quantum winter. And if you have questions, I'm happy to for you to contact me directly. Uh, you can find out more about QEDC and some of the reports I referenced on our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celia, for, for uh, an engaging presentation. We're getting responses to your movie question being there. Good. <laughs> so apparently the, the MITRE staff can pass the uh, the obscure cultural reference uh, question uh, with flying colors. Um, and it also is nice to show that the, the system is actually working. Um, I don't have a lot of questions uh, as yet, but let me ask one myself. So I'll exercise the, you know, moderator's prerogative. Um, the survey that you conducted aside and the data that you're collecting from your consortium and membership, which which part of uh, your presentation do you think would be most indicative of a problem if one were to arise? Where would you like? To, where would you most likely see it coming first? Would you think of it in terms of is the investment question the right way to think about it, or would it be more along the lines of government regulation or concern about? Um, um, you know, well, I mean, I will tell you one thing that I think is concerning, and, and there are others who are really in the middle of the business world um, more than I am, but, uh, and I didn't refer to the fact that over the last couple of years, several companies have gone public, and uh, some of them aren't really flourishing, and if a company uh, that, you know, chose that path ends up having to declare bankruptcy or, you know, somehow really disappear, you know, fail. Uh, I think that would be, um, uh, that would send a signal that was interpreted very broadly that maybe shouldn't be. So um, I think that would be um, something to watch for because I think that would convey. Now, you know, we had other things happening that were not quantum specific like Silicon Valley Bank. And how is that? impacting this these emerging technologies, not just quantum, others as well. Is it drying things up? Is it making it harder? I do hear a lot of concern from the small companies that are members of the consortium about their ability to fundraise and whether that's going to get harder and harder. Because I think access to capital is really critical. And, um, that, and that's really based on um, belief and you know, some confidence, but in the case of an emerging technology, it's not really based on the fact that there's existing revenue models. You know, this is not make me an app and it's going to have a network effect and we're all going to make a lot of money. So um, sort of these small, sometimes marginal or peripheral events, I think could impact the field and, and create a, a, an accelerating effect that would maybe not be based on the technology itself even. I worry about that more than the technology. I think the science is going to continue to advance and uh, understandings will grow. But whether we're going to have a winter, like AI, you know, now we're kind of back on top with AI. 
um, I don't know. I'd be interested in others' thoughts on that as well. So it's interesting. If I understand your answer correctly, it, it's almost as though you you uh, an indicator might be not the declining in, in entry investment, but rather the acceleration of exits in terms of companies, bankruptcies, and uh, other people who are failing out of the field. Right. Right. I mean, these numbers where it shows some kind of decrease, I'm not sure that indicates anything to do with the technology. I think it can be due to other reasons. Luke may have something he wants to add when you get to the, the panel or open it up more. Well, there are, there are some questions online about the, the realistic applications for the technology and, and how many qubits are we going to need before something, you know, a pro, something gets productized. I don't know if uh, Yakov is expecting... Um, to cover that during the panel or not, but certainly happy to, to have you uh, comment on that, Celia. Uh, also, a um, number of people have asked for the link from the page in your presentation. I don't know if you sent that to uh, Ty or EJ. We'd like to make sure we get that published out. Um, I know you flashed it on the screen quickly, but we'd like to shove it in oh. the chat quick. Yep, I will make sure it gets there. Thank um, you. In terms of um, you know what is going to how we're going to sort of see technology advancing and when is it going to cross some line that is quantum advantage, the, the, that quantum provides an advantage over classical technology. Um, there's a couple of, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty as to when on the time curve that might happen. I think it will happen, but there's a couple of reasons that make it hard to predict. One is it's a hard problem. I mean, th there are some significant challenges to scaling up a quantum computer. There are several different technologies being developed, and, and we may end up with more than one type of quantum computer with sort of um, applications or, or um, you know, abilities, capabilities that are better for certain types of problems or certain form factors or whatever. Um, and then there's the fact that the classical technology keeps improving as well. So that also pushes up and out the crossover to quantum advantage. And I think another thing, and this is where I think we kind of sometimes have blinders on, and that is we're not necessarily just, try, well, we definitely are not trying to just do some existing problem faster. This is not extending Moore's law per se. This is shining light on a whole space of problems that is really intractable today. And so Thinking, and that's where I think there's a lot of interest and curiosity and maybe being able to do some things with these relatively noisy, low-performing machines that um, might not be easily done with um, conventional or classical technology. When we asked companies what kind of jobs they were looking to fill in the next few years, quantum algorithm developer was one of the most frequently checked boxes by the companies. So developing a quantum algorithm is going to require thinking differently. And, and if you're in a company that's developing, you know, pharmaceuticals or looking at financial portfolio analysis or some other logistics problem or something, uh, or materials design and development, um, you, you need to have people who are able to really come at it with fresh eyes. And I think that's, that gets back to some of the workforce development and how students are being trained at universities and so on. And that's another area, of course, where government investment has a big role to play. Well, that's a, that's a great comment. Um, well, let me, let me end here uh, and thank our speaker again, our keynote. I certainly hope you'll stick around uh, with the panel. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Yakov will, will uh, welcome your participation in that. Let me take a moment to uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Yakov Weinstein, uh, who presently serves, uh, has been at MITRE for uh, over 15 years and, and serves as the Chief Scientist for Quantum Technology here within MITRE Labs, uh, who's going to introduce the panel and moderate the rest of the session. So Yakov, over to you. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Specter of a Quantum Winter panel. Um, so first uh, first order of business, let me just uh, go around the virtual room here and have everyone introduce themselves. Uh, Luke, let's start with you. Mm. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Yakov. And um, uh, so I'm uh, the founder of Montana Instruments. Montana Instruments uh, builds cryogenic systems for uh, quantum applications. Uh, I, I originally founded the company. I've sold now just as of uh, four or five months now. So I'm looking at next things. But uh, I come from the supply chain. Montana Instruments would be a good example of a quantum supply chain company. 
Thanks. Great. Thank you, Luke. And uh, Bob, Bob Suter. Hi, I'm Bob Sutor. Uh, I'm vice president and Oh, the title du jour is Chief Quantum Advocate. Um, I was Great uh, title. <laughs> I was at IBM for, uh, for many years, including uh, the last five or six years in the IBM Quantum Program, where I was I was one of the leaders of that. Um, uh, I've written a couple of books on on, on quantum. Um, generally speaking, um, quantum is hard, um, and explaining people it, it to people uh, can also be hard at times, but I think valuable. Um, and what I'll end this part of saying is, you know, quantum does not equal quantum computing. And whatever the specter of a quantum computing winter may be, there's absolutely no winter on quantum sensing and quantum communication. Very good. All right. Don't give away the answer yet. We've got a, we've got a whole panel to go still. Uh, okay. uh, Mike, please. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you, Yakov, and it's great to be here today. Uh, it's an honor to be part of the, this panel. My title's not nearly as cool as Bob's, but I am the Deputy Director at the AFRL Information Directorate, and I also coordinate the Quantum Information Science Program across the AFRL Enterprise, which Bob was kind of alluding to is more than quantum computing. It includes timing, sensing, uh, networking, as well as computing. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Brandon? Hi, I'm Brandon Rodenberg. I run the Quantum Technologies Group here at MITRE. Um, so for those of you outside of MITRE, uh, we're, we're the ones running this uh, this power hour. MITRE uh, operates uh, FFRDCs, which are uh, research and development centers that operate on uh, the, the public interest. So for the government, my team is responsible for expertise in things like uh, quantum computing, quantum networking, and to a lesser extent, because we have a separate group for it, quantum sensing. Uh, primarily offering advice and research to various uh, parts of the uh, U.S. government. Great. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, so to start with our first question, uh, you know, Castilia already highlighted that over the past couple of years, there's been $4.5 billion um, investment in uh, quantum startups. Um, in addition, in the McKinsey reports that uh, Celia mentioned, um, they estimated that the U.S. government has spent $3.7 billion in total so far over uh, four quantum technologies. Uh, Mike, head up, you know, AFRL as a distinguished part of our US government and certainly one that has invested uh, in quantum heavily. Let's start with you. Like, is, is it that exciting? Is quantum really that important? Absolutely. And I think, you know, from the Air Force perspective, uh, we've been investing in quantum for many years. You know, it's not like we just started doing quantum. We can go back to our history and in a lot of different areas and certainly, you know, quantum 1.0 and the different application areas. But certainly, you know, we see when we talk about our program, uh, operational uh, viewpoints, operational requirements that quantum will be meeting. And it's not going to happen tomorrow uh, for all technologies, but we do see things like timing and sensing where you can really apply it to a, a PNT, positioning, navigation, and timing problem, where you might be in a contested uh, GPS environment where you need, you know, alternative means in, in quantum we'll be able to do that for you. And the good news is, you know, we're able to demonstrate some technologies right now um, that are doing just that. It's gonna take us a while to, to field systems, but we see that as a near-term point. Uh, and then, you know, a little further out, computing and networking, um, we're gonna get there, but certainly on the computing side, we're looking at, you know, Celia kind of alluded to this more on the algorithm side, where we're relying on industry to develop the hardware. But we're right now, you know, partnered with some companies out there, such as IBM and INQ, and having access to their cloud systems, and you know, looking at what problems would be of interest to the Air Force, where we can actually make a difference. And then, certainly, you know, we see networking as a really exciting technology. Obviously, the security aspect comes first to mind, but um, uh, also, you know, how can you tie together different quantum computers, network them together, whether it's on a small scale or a larger scale. And then as we talk about clocks and sensors and um, time distribution, you know, that's where we see a network coming into play as well. So we have active researcher areas across seven of our nine technology directorates in AFRL. Um, so certainly, you know, we've been investing heavily and we continue to be at quantum for the long haul. Great. Uh, Brandon, let me let me uh, turn the question over to you and ask a little bit differently. So AFRL, of course, is a research-based uh, laboratory, one of, one of the best in the country without question. Um, as an FFRDC, MITRE uh, presumably speaks to government agencies that are not particularly interested in research per se, um, but in practical technologies. What do you what do you see um, in terms of excitement within quantum technologies and in, in, throughout the government? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
So there's uh, certainly a lot of interest just from the, the hype that we're all worried about uh, here. So first and foremost, uh, going back many years, a lot of the questions we have fielded were along the lines of what the heck is this quantum thing and what could it possibly do for us? Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of excitement in computing specifically, uh, in part because of that, uh, how big of a part it plays sort of in the hype cycle. And so, uh, you know, it's it's easier to connect the dots without necessarily uh, understanding what the key applications will be in computing, just because we've sort of lived through a century of computing transforming our world. And so if you say you have sort of uh, the next generation of computing, I think it's easy for people to imagine it'll have an impact even if they don't know specifically where it'll have an impact in, uh, but especially uh, more not uh, short term, uh, where uh, specific operational uh, environments are are being thought and the specific scenarios are being thought of. Uh, the quantum sensing is something that is is very exciting uh, in the government space. Um, as, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, we've kind of gone through sort of a, the quantum 1.0, uh, arguably things like uh, atomic clocks and things like this are the, the cornerstone of a lot of of our modern society, both sort of uh, in the government space, the national security spaces, and, and in the private world as well. And so there's a lot of interest in sort of, well, uh, sensors to really transform a lot of parts in our society. What uh, uh, what could sort of next generation versions of these look like, whether it's better sensitivity or whether it's uh, uh, sort of getting similar performance that we currently see in, in very large strategic systems, turning that into much smaller systems that you can then sort of deploy more cheaply or uh, more easily in uh, in more platforms. Sure. Um, and Bob, from you know, you're, you're representing the industry. You've been part of uh, IBM and now uh, Inflection slash called Quanta. Um, what do you see as excitement, both uh, within your industry and uh, and from current and potential customers? So I continue to be excited about the, if you will, the new modalities that are being introduced for for quantum. So when it was with IBM, we did superconducting. Many other people do that as well, Google and so forth. Um, and in fact, one of the things that intrigued me about cold quanta at the time was the idea of cold or, or neutral atoms, which I will admit to knowing virtually nothing about before they contacted me. Um, and But what I also realized with that um, versus some of the other things we had heard about, such as uh, ion traps, uh, maybe photonic, was that there really were a number of up and coming technologies that were going to hit at certain times, but later than the, the noisy original ones. And even some of them, like Ion Trap, I mean, people were doing 20 years ago, uh, and, and things like this. So as we look out into the future, you're going to see technologies which maybe don't compare well to some of the others today, but they will compare better in the future, but they'll have different uses. Right. So not every single, let me call it a qubit today, will end up in a big quantum computer, a supercomputer in a data center. And in fact, we don't need that. We need things like quantum memory. Right. Um, as we broaden and we think of, of quantum sensors, um, you know, quantum sensors are a great, great way of getting quantum encoded data which is actually very hard classically, but relatively easy to do from a sensor perspective. And that data is going to need computation and it's going to need to be done at the edge. So if we go back and we look at the history of computing, you know, we're not all dealing with great monster, big monster computers somewhere, right? Uh, with the high priests and priestesses. Um, computing becomes ubiquitous or at least spreads out. The same is gonna be happening. So I think the people who um, are looking beyond the data center, um, just as they are with AI, federated AI, federated learning and things like that, to the edge at least, will be able to pull this technology forward as we go. And this will drive quantum networking, which will be absolutely essential, and we'll understand better which technology is best for which uses. Great, thank you. And, uh, and and Luke, you you started a company to support the quantum ecosystem, not even a quantum company. Uh, certainly, you must have seen some excitement there. What did you see? <laughs> yeah, it's when I when I started Montana Instruments, uh, quantum wasn't something we were talking about at that time. This was in 2010. So then, fast forward five years, and we wake up one morning, and I realize 95% of our customers are developing quantum materials. And I guess that's when we realized, oh, we're a quantum company. <laughs> and that's and you know, we made a we made a definite pivot 
right? In, in our approach, in our communication, in our direction at that point as well, as, as we realized that and, and just grew it. And then the, the, we, we just saw many of our, um, many of our customers in the university were going out, spinning off, starting new companies, and then they were getting funded. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're not just serving uh, academics, but we're serving um, big and small companies all of a sudden all over the world. So then we saw that transition um, ourselves. And, um, and I, I come from the, the, the supply chain, of course, uh, and, and I, you know, cryogenics, that's one area. There are, uh, you know, you think of photonics, you think of cryogenics, uh, you think of electronics. Um, and a point I'll probably stress later on in our talking today is we have to realize this is a research industry. It's not a real supply chain yet. That supply chain has to be built uh, beginning now. And so we've, when we look at quantum computing and even quantum sensing, uh, we've kind of cobbled together whatever we can do with a bunch of research instruments, right? Uh, and there, there are, you know, even if we were to solve the, the the challenge of error correction, say, of quantum computing, we could all of a sudden scale qubits from that perspective. We still can't scale um, because of the the components, because of even the non-quantum components that, uh, you know, you can't imagine scaling to a million um, low noise amplifiers, right? Uh, size, you know, a few milliwatts of power each one, right? And so th there are many reasons why that supply chain, I think, needs to be uh, uh, in, our, in a greater focus now for us today, um, um, anticipating quantum advantage within the next several years and then, and then moving on from that. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's start approaching the question du jour. Um, the specter of a quantum winter. So besides the statistics that uh, um, Carl quoted at the beginning of, of the session, um, the McKinsey report also notes that, uh, suggests that by the year 2035, the economic impact of quantum computing alone will be between 0.6 and $1.2 trillion. That's trillion with a T. That's a really large number. Um, besides the fact that, you know, 50% of all um, uh, quantum companies um, surveyed by Zapata already have a uh, million dollars invested in quantum computing uh, and are expecting a business advantage within five years. Um, Celia, you know, very nicely outlined um, her um, thoughts on whether there's a quantum winter starting. I want to know more, not is there one starting, but are we setting ourselves up for a quantum winter, perhaps starting soon, perhaps starting a few years down the line. So, uh, so Bob, you already uh, hinted mm -hmm. in your in your first answer towards this. Right. So let's start with you. How is quantum sensing going to save us, or is that the answer you want to give? Well, well, I mean, addressing the the whole winter <laughs> thing, um, I have known for years that people who, not everybody, but many people who do quantum startups feel that they should be immune to the normal startup failure rate, mm. right? So if 70 to 90% of all startups fail, they kind of say, but we're doing quantum and quantum is so great. We, none of us should fail, right? And um, <laughs> it's like, I looked at them and say, this, this whole thing is kind of new to you, right? You know, <laughs> this idea here. And and so in in fact, you know, a certain amount of failure represents progress as, as the the good players get sorted out with the right technologies and the right management and, and things like that. So sometimes it's a little makes me a little nervous that some of them go don't go away, if you will. And I'm sure they do um very very quietly. Um a lot of this is perception. So years ago, you know, I remember very clearly. Uh, because look, IBM tries to be very honest. And, you know, as Celia pointed out, they have a roadmap and they point these things out. And they said, "Don't expect this before then." But it tends to be perceived like, okay, so you're going on vacation with a child, and you put the child in the back seat of the car, and you say, "This is going to take three hours to drive there." And after 15 minutes, your kid says, "Are we there yet?" You say, no, I, I told you it was going to be three hours. But the kid says, but I want to be there. You know, and the kid, if if he or she knew better, would say, we must be in a vacation winter, 
right? Because I want to be there and we're not, right? Even though everyone said that th this was going to take a while. Um, I think on the investment front, um, we're well into the second or third generation of many investments. Um, yes, the, the SPACs for the most part, majority of them didn't go too well ultimately, but SPACs in general, right? And so for everything on the investment side, you can say, well, gee, maybe quantum investment isn't as great, but we had this amazing tech downturn uh, in the last year. Why should quantum be immune from that? Um, the Silicon Valley Bank, <laughs> you know, take that money, put it under the mattress. So it's not just quantum again and things like that. So I would say things are, are, are generally proceeding, but people are getting smarter about Two things. One is, as I mentioned before, the breadth of applicability of quantum technologies. And we're reminding them that things like MRIs are quantum technologies. They've been around for 40 years, right? This isn't some brand new impossible thing. And people are starting to learn that it's not just qubits, right? It's qubits and qubits get connected to other qubits. And we have to build these things up and connectivity becomes important and networking things and oh, repeaters, routers, <laughs> you know, all these standard computing things. So as people get into this, I think they will understand there's a wealth of work and research that's being done on the large picture, not just as this one set of qubits solve any one problem. Sure. That whole infrastructure I think is moving along nicely. Um, with 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 investment and and with an increasing amount of of government investment, primarily due to geopolitical events. So, if I could just uh, um, summarize, so you're confident that the educational um, objectives that the community has been putting forward, in that this is going to take a long time. This is something that is not, um, uh, you know, that already has capabilities in the field, and we need some more time to develop some of these new capabilities. That that message is coming across. And uh, and you're not concerned that investors are going to start pulling back, um, or that people are going to stop dropping, um, start start dropping interest in quantum, despite the fact that you expect, and we all expect, that a certain number of startups will in fact fail. Is that is that a fair? Yeah, I do. I do think mm -hmm. seed money will continue. Small amounts of seed money, mm -hmm. right? I think investors will double down on their invest existing investments for mm -hmm. companies that can prove that they've made themselves. And proving is not marketing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just to be clear about that. So if they can demonstrate real progress, then they'll continue to get done. Mm -hmm. awesome. uh, Luke, you've been doing a lot of uh, thinking about uh, the quantum winter and dual dual use quantum, especially in the um, context of the QEDC. What, what do you think about? Uh, are we setting ourselves up for 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 uh, to, to drop in the hype hype cycle here? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I think I I think I I don't really see a quantum winter at least not like a not like a Montana winter maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe some cooling right and I and I I like what Bob said about the ecosystem like this whole entire um, system of uh, technologies that are interconnected and dependent upon each other that we're building an ecosystem now. And and that is going to take time. I I think I I like to watch. I mean, there are, there are a lot of great quantum companies out there. I like to watch IBM, for instance, because they, they, they don't have to they don't have to make any promises. They don't have to impress anybody. They don't have to raise money. Right? They're a big ship. They, they, they've set their rudder and their direction, uh, their roadmap, and they tend to be hitting it. And uh, you know they've got the grand challenge, 100 qubits by 100 gates, and that seems to be on track. So um, I think that we'll see in the next one to two years uh, some results that that actually demonstrate that quantum computing is real. Now the general public won't be all that impressed because it'll probably be some for some obscure chemistry application or something like that that doesn't really affect them they don't think about right but it, but it'll be for us and in the community we'll realize this is significant and and when the when those first applications happen i think what's what, what's uh, what's going to be interesting is that what 
when when quantum advantage starts to turn and and we see that those first applications are actually um, happening, then we're probably going to be discovering uh, new solution sets and new problems that maybe we hadn't thought about before. And it might still be obscure, but it'll take on a it'll take on a new life of its own in in development. And I, I guess that's where the quantum algorithm uh, developers come in with that that the earlier uh, comment there. So um, so I think we'll I think we'll see that. And we've we've talked about quantum sensing, and I think that there's a lot of advance that can be made there. Um, and then I'll I'll come back to also just reiterate the importance of of building an ecosystem if you look at the quantum supply chain it's totally not ready right and it's not just that the technologies are not ready the companies are not ready the the many of the companies there are are, are smaller companies they might be mom and pop shop oriented um it might be a lifestyle company it might be small if 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 a if if quantum computing needed to scale up now a lot of those companies would just break because mm-hmm. uh, they're not a, they're not OEMs, um, so th- that foundational work I think is um, really important for us to be doing now, and the government has a definite role in that. Uh, be, investors aren't ready to just jump in and start funding supply chain companies when we don't even know what the ROI is or when that's going to happen. So, so that, I guess one point I'll make is the government re- really needs to. Um, I think take the role of a de-risker, and if they do that right, for every dollar that the government puts out, it could there be two or five or ten that come from private industry. That's that's the that's what we want to do over the next ten years. I think. Thank you, Luke. So, Brandon, I'm not going to ask you to compare, um, you know, the your home state of Nebraska's winters to uh, Montana's winters, but um, but you speak to government people. Um, is government up to be patient, or is government the child in the back of the car who's going to complain after 15 minutes that we're not there yet? Yeah, I really think it depends on uh, who you're talking to. Uh, at some sense, uh, the government has been funding quantum for decades now, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Really, a lot of the stuff that we've seen grow in the last 10 years has come from uh, a, a very long history of, of putting money into basic research and uh, into academia. And really, from the government's perspective, at least from these sort of very deep research, uh, long-term view perspective of some of the agencies from, within the government, the thing that's new is you're starting to see the center of mass shift from sort of that academic basic research into industry, which is exactly what ultimately we want these technologies to do. Um, so I think that now there are, are a lot more people within the government who are now thinking about quantum than 10, 20 years ago, who were the people sort of funding the research. And they're going to have different priorities. And some of them, uh, you know, have budget cycles on the order of a year or mission uh, statements that they're trying to, mission problems they're trying to solve on the order of, you know, three years. And uh, so, so for some of these some of these parts of the government, there might be a mismatch in expectations with with the quantum. No, we really are, you know, five years out. We really are ten years out on on some of these things. Uh, so I'm I'm sorry, we're not going to you know save the day on your mission. You know that you're going to fly, you know, in six months. But um, but really, we're thinking the next generation of of problems, or the next generation of uh, you know airplanes, or the next generation of uh, you know things that we're we're trying to solve, and we're trying to solve those now because. Um, that's just how this works. So I think, I think as long as we have that perspective, I, I think that at least on the on the public side, I think that uh, um, we're we're pretty pretty healthy. Uh, we always have the advantage of we don't actually have to worry too much about return on investment. You know, uh, too soon we can really invest in generational uh, problems in the public sector. <laughs> And, and, and Mike, um, uh, I'm not going to say anything about the winter in Rome, except to note that I'm coming to visit you in June. Um, but <laughs> me, um, you know, what, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're working on um, uh, heading, you know, a major effort at a research-based laboratory. Um, let me fit in a co- at least one of the questions from, from, from our audience. Like, what are, what are some of the milestones that you're looking to demonstrate to the Air Force in general? Like, how, how do you, how do you convince um, when you have officers, um, or even perhaps the Secretary of the Air Force, come into Rome, how do you convince them that this is this is really worthwhile? 
And that, you yeah. know, so it's, uh, sure they, don't, they, don't, they don't cause the quantum winter, but bring people back. <laughs> no, that, that's a great question. And I think one of my jobs is to really, and it's, you know, it's not just me, it's, it's a team from Cross AFRL, yeah. is to really go out and educate the senior leadership. I think I mentioned that early on uh, about the hype. Uh, because they get companies coming in all the time, including the secretary of the Air Force, all right, uh, you know, trying to sell him something. And it happens all across the Air Force and the Space Force. So we, you know, we get kind of turned to as the trusted agents, if you will, uh, to kind of uh, sort through all that hype and what's real. And, and we do that. And, you know, in that we also have to have a vision, right? So when will this happen? When will we you know, I have results and we're, you know, we're trying to step through that very smartly in terms of our roadmaps, uh, uh, you know, like with timing and sensing, uh, those are near term applications. So we partnered uh, just this past summer with, uh, you know, some international partners and Army and Navy and did some demonstrations at sea. Uh, on how you can take some technology that, you know, isn't ready for prime time yet. There's no way it's ready yet. But, you know, how can we look at, you know, some supply chain things, some ruggedization uh, issues and, and really start moving it out? Because it is, as we said earlier, it's a continuous research cycle. So, but we have to not be afraid to move things out from the lab either. Right? We have to do it smartly. We also did some work earlier this uh, year, last summer, actually, uh, in fall on a drone and you know how we could do some entanglement distribution and we're going to look to build upon that we learned a lot and you know we're going to continue to work with some of our partners out there and doing things like that so it's taking those steps and kind of you know what we call spiral development in the government um having off ramps but we always have to caveat that with that you know it's not going to be one and done it's going to be a continuous research uh program that we need and we have to be in for the long haul one of the things I always like to talk about, former uh, boss of mine, director here in Rome, used to say, you know, it takes 20 years to be an overnight success. And yeah. it's so true, right? I used to have a great slide on that. And I know he stole a quote from someone, but uh, it, it's true. And, you know, we're fortunate we're a research lab to be able to do that. But, you know, um, it, it's going to take investment for the long haul. And I liked what was said earlier, too. Uh, by Luke about being a de-risker in the government. And that is something, you know, we do here take quite seriously. For example, like our quantum networking program, we're looking at different modalities of qubits. Um, you know, certainly not going to pick one winner for quantum networking. Each has the ones we're looking at has strengths, it has current weaknesses. But, you know, how can we look at research and to transduction, being able to go between you know, the different qubits. So I think that's where we have a role. Uh, things like our um, SBIR, STTR programs help de-risk the technology. We had a large quantum collider event two years ago. And some of the things I talked about actually spun out of that event. So you know, if we can do more things like that in the future and encourage folks to partner with AFWorks uh, and Stratfly and TACFly where it matches, you know, Air Force investment with some VC investment, you can get some real money there as well, but it helps de-risk some of the technology for, you know, maybe some of the investors out there. And, and so let me, going back to the milestones though, so um, demonstrations, um, uh, you know, um, demonstrations first of the technology themselves, um, demonstrations that there are a number of uh, different possible ways to reach a goal and that we're moving forward not only on one technology, but really exploring a number in order to lower the risk as much as possible. Are those, is that, they're, they're not necessarily concrete milestones, but are those um, uh, useful ways and constructive ways to keep interest um, within government and perhaps in, within the public? Absolutely. And, you know, and I will say, you know, we have internal roadmaps, though, where we do set, you know, specific targets, specific goals, and, you know, not necessarily going to be operational requirements where we're, we're putting something on a, a platform, right, an F-35 tomorrow. But, you know, down the line, we can envision applications where that would happen, but you have to kind of have those stepping stones and, and milestones to get you there. So, it, it, you know, we do have a strategy that we follow with goals and milestones and, you know, keeping in mind that, yes, we have to, you know, we're not a pure research lab, we're not academia, we have to uh, solve ultimately Air Force problems in the end. Great. Um, is Celia still online? Do you think I could grab Celia for a second? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'll, 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 if, if if she appears, then we can. Uh, oh, okay, great. So, so Celia, let me let me let me, let me ask you for you know as, as we're going on here. So, so Bob, you know, I, I correctly mentioned the fact that you know startups don't all succeed. Uh, even if they do think they all should succeed, they don't. Um, what happens when seventy to ninety percent of the startups fail? Now, they also it's obviously not going to happen like that overnight. But uh, as membership in QEDC perhaps. Uh, doesn't always continue to increase, but uh, but starts perhaps going down, um, if even if even moderately. Are we concerned about not a run on Silicon Valley Bank, but a run away from quantum? Well, I guess um, I think that the equation has more terms than just the current existing startup group, right? So they're going to not all go through, but there are going to be new ones um, coming along and. And I see that happening all around the world. I mean, the UK has a very robust program that's generated quite a few interesting startups. So I, I feel like, um, you know, the pipeline, you want to make sure the pipeline continues to be robust. And if you're investing as much as is being invested in the fundamental early stage work that governments are, there will be a continuous stream, I think, of of new ideas and people willing to, you know, take a, take a bet on them. Um, I, I asked this, I've been doing research since I was asked to be on this panel. And, and one of the opportunities I had to do that, I was at the University of Maryland um, quantum startup foundry event last week. And I asked this question of a panel that I was host or moderating. And one of the responses was that, um, you know, a winter now and then was kind of healthy. It, it causes pruning and, you know, it gets rid of the weak mm -hmm. um, parts of the ecosystem that really, that it serves a purpose, if you will, or the valley of death does that, you know, on a regular basis. Right. So, um, you know, I'm not the one who's out there. It's not my company that's failing. Obviously, I'm looking at this as like mm -hmm. epidemiology. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the whole population here and um, and seeing a way that organically it's staying healthy. Mm -hmm. I think the government needs to be very careful. There are Proposals, and I think DOD even has some kind of set asides maybe for swooping in and rescuing failing entities um, in order that they won't be bought by someone who would, you know, take the technology elsewhere and the people, um, the talent. So that that's a complicated um, policy question, frankly, because not every failing activity should be rescued, and so how you go about deciding what's critical, both from a security point of view, as well as from a, you know, technology, it's a good idea. It just needs a little bit more uh, uh, runway to get off the ground. It's hard to say. Great. So, um, uh, Luke, let me turn, turn to you for a second, because you first mentioned the government, uh, government role in a significant way. Um, what happens if we are faced with a quantum winter? Like, what's the risk? Why should the government be concerned or perhaps not concerned about uh, about the possibility? If the government just really significantly slowed down or stopped funding in quantum, mm -hmm. uh, then a lot of the small companies that depend on that uh, would just go away, mm -hmm. right? And because then you're dependent 100% on some other industry, right? Uh, which is okay. So I, you know, I can come back to that, but I, you know, all you'd have is the large companies who um, have, you know, who are generating revenue enough revenue elsewhere uh, to maintain R and D around uh, quantum, right? And then they would have their own reasons for doing that, right? Um, so, so I guess that's the right now so my advice my advice to a, a company that's in the quantum industry and and especially many of these quantum supply chain companies is the, the healthiest way to exist right now is to be uh, is 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 to have your foot in another industry as well and you know you think of photonics you think of cryogenics you think of electronics all these uh, technologies um, can reach across broad industries. It might be the aerospace industry. It might be the medical industry. Um, of course, research is part of that, but that's the that's the government funded portion of it. Um, so, so make sure that you've got a market there and you're developing a market there and you've got cash flow there, right? Because that's gonna that's gonna allow your company to be healthy. But then position yourself 
and continually position yourself in, in the quantum industry. And, uh, you know, hopefully there's a little bit of revenue there. Hopefully there's some market there and, and, um, and you've got some relationships with the customers there. And hopefully there's a reason right now, most of that's a research industry right now. Right. Uh, most of that work for, for those players. But I think um, the, 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 the advice is position yourself there so that when that industry starts moving forward uh, in a, in a, you know, hits a virtuous cycle, you know, where it's generating real revenue and it's time to scale some things up. Now you're positioned. Well, uh, if you're not positioned, well, it, it might be, it might be very hard to position yourself. Well, at that time, but you kind of have to be moving with that industry every year. Right. And, and you might not have a lot of revenue, but if you're positioned well, then, then you can take advantage of, of that time and place when the, when the industry is scaling up, which will happen. So, okay, so you're already, you're already cheated and gone to the next question, which is how do you, how do you mitigate a quantum winter? So, uh, and, and Celia, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. But before that, before we get to that, um, uh, Brandon, let me bother you about this one. Um, China and the EU are both spending more money than the United States is. Um, in terms of government spending on quantum, uh, China significantly so, um, especially if the U.S. were to pull back. How does that speak to our national security? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think that there is important uh, implications in this area. So uh, this this kind of a direct goes to the heart of sort of industrial policy and quantum workforce and things like this as well, is if there are no jobs for people to stay in quantum, then they're going to go elsewhere. And that might be uh, mean that we lose this, this, uh, these brains to other, other countries, other regions of the world. Um, and it might be that uh, it sort of just atrophies within our own country. So people might get a degree in something related to quantum, but then they go get a job in something completely different. And in 10 years, if things start up again, it, it m might be very hard for these people to pivot, or maybe they don't want to. They're already mature and have 10 years along a different uh, route. And uh, I think there's large time lags that happen with with big and long events. And so if there is a winter and then once it, it, it picks up again, so fast forward to, you know, thinking of the AI winters, it could very drastically change sort of at, at, at the nation level where you're positioned to, to jump back in. Um, and so I, I think we can look at data now and say, you know, there are various ways in which, you know, this is the competitive advantages in the U.S. In computing, for instance, there's, I think, no question, the U.S. is kind of the center of mass of what quantum computing is. Um, China has a lot of, uh, of efforts, especially in, say, QKD and quantum networks that are probably positioned them better in some respects than, than the rest of the world. Um, but uh, you go through a, a winter and then things rekindle and there can be a complete reshuffling of these of these things. So um, to the extent that there is national security implications for keeping a competitive advantage, being X number of years ahead of other countries, I, I think it's important to, even if there is a quantum winter, make sure that there's still a... Um, a refuge for some of the stuff to still exist uh, through that winter within our country. Great. Mike, any, any thoughts on uh, what happens if the government uh, pulls back? Yeah, so, you know, one, I, I don't see certainly not the U.S. government pulling back anytime soon. I, I think Staley showed some great data from quantum.gov, you know, on that, which shows a pretty consistent investment. Uh, the NQI, National Quantum Initiative Act, uh, is up for renewal. You know, certainly I think that'll... You know, hopefully go through. We'll see continued funding with that. We'll be also be able to leverage, you know, assuming it gets appropriated in the Chips and Science Act uh, funding from that as well. So, you know, I think even um, the DOD Microelectronic Commons, that's going to have significant funding in it attached to quantum. So I think there's different pieces of this that all just kind of add up. So, in you know, I never liked to, we were just discussing this the other day at a you know, quantum tech event is never like to actually compare absolute numbers, right? Because, you know, I, I think what's important is the U.S. has significant uh, investments in it and the U.S. is partnering with other, you know, countries like valued countries as well to advance the field. Um, so places like England, which was just referenced, UK, I should say, uh, with their national quantum strategy and 2.5 billion over 10 years, you know, that's great. And I think that'll only help the U.S. to continue to push things along. And, you know, as it is, right, we are building an ecosystem here. 
um, you know, not just in the U.S., but certainly worldwide uh, to solve very critical problems. And I think one of the great things, too, in the U.S. that's been great, I alluded to it briefly, but just to kind of footstep it, the, you know, stand up with the National Quantum Coordination Office has been huge, right? Bringing together different government organizations that, you know, are formally linked together now under this uh, act. And as well as the DOD having a formal quantum coordinator and Dr. Burke, uh, it, you know, just aligning things together and getting the most bang for our buck in the investments and then smartly partnering as well. And then, you know, smartly investing as well uh, in the quantum ecosystem. And, you know, can't say it enough too. Um, you know, what we continue to see at the investments at, at the country level, at the government level for workforce development. And that's something we've been very actively involved with um, uh, OSTP on is, you know, how we can move forward, uh, move the industry forward and, you know, what our gaps and requirements are uh, in the years to come. So I think that's going to be important when you kind of think along the lines of the big picture here. That's great. So, so Cecilia, let me, let me go back to you, um, uh, because, you know, you're certainly talking to a lot of industry. Um, when you when, when you consult with, uh, with your industry members about um, how to succeed, um, what is what does that conversation look like? Like how are you how are you helping them avoid a quantum winter that could affect them alone or affect the field as a whole? Yeah. Um, so I I do kind of assess that um, by a number of ways. We do occasional sort of questions of the membership about what they want QEDC to do more of. What's the sort of value of an association like this and what can we do to help? I talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. I'll make, a, I'll summarize a couple of observations. One is um, sometimes we organize groups to go talk to folks on the Hill, for instance. And, and when those kinds of policymakers ask, what can we do to help? Often one of the answers that comes back is the government can be an early customer somehow. And what that, what form that takes, there's many examples, of course, in the past where the government has taken that role, been willing to pay maybe a premium at the beginning and kind of get things going. Are we there now? Uh, certainly, I think Mike and other parts of DOD are stepping up and um, investing heavily in certain types of sensors for PNT and you know inertial um, systems and so on. So. Um, there are certain use cases that the government sees as ones that they're going to be critically enabling and customers of, and that there are likely going to be spillover benefits to commercial applications. And this is a really classical dual use set of technologies. Um, in terms of the quantum computing side, there is a small part of the Chips and Science Act called Quest, which aims to set aside a little bit of money into a program where researchers could go apply for a supplement to maybe an existing NSF grant or something to give them money to access commercial quantum computing resources. And so that would be a way for government funds to flow ultimately to the people who are developing quantum computing capabilities. And there would be some kind of a you know portal or dashboard and on ramps, and that would enable researchers, students, and so on to get hands-on experience. And it would be presumably good for the education and, and research side, but also would accelerate progress on the hardware side and software. Um, so those are some of the kind of areas where I think QEDC members see the government being able to step in and really help. Um, there also are, of course, sort of non-quantum specific policies around immigration and, um, and other sort of areas where government could help get rid of some friction that would generally help. Um, we did start a program just this week um, called Quantum Business 101. So we're going to have within QADC a series of programs that are really aimed at the small companies and startups. Right. And the quantum is sort of in parentheses. So, you know, helping them understand everything about getting a business to succeed from protecting IP and social media marketing and hiring people. And um, so it's not really quantum specific, but it's, you know, a lot of the quantum companies are run by technologists and people who don't really know how to navigate some of the business side. So um, hopefully we'll have people like Luke who come and talk about how to do it right. That, that sounds great. Um, sign me up. No, I'm sorry. I'm happy I made her. Um, Bob, you know, you went from, uh, you know, you went from, uh, from, from, from a place like IBM, which, you know, if they wanted to, 
could support their own quantum, uh, you know, quantum funding without uh, necessarily relying on you know immediate return on investment. Uh, but now, now you have Inflection, which is certainly a much smaller company and one that is uh, um, almost really one hundred percent focused on quantum. Um, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you prepare inflection for, uh, you know, possibility of a quantum winter? How do you circumvent that possibility for inflection? Well, I thought of one more thing that could cause a quantum winter, you know, mm. a, a topic for a future power hour. Which sure. Is, will there be a photonics winter? <laughs> it's good. Really? Um, are you, are you, don't hold on. Hold on. If you can start getting north, if you kind of start start getting upstate New York into the whole photonics question, and well, also you know Bozeman, Montana, and photonics, we're going to never end this session. So we're not going to talk about that now. Right. So <laughs> ahead, we'll, we'll stay away from that. But many <laughs> of the the uses of, of of quantum and eventually networking, right? Um, connecting smaller quantum systems or sensors together is going to be optical, right? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of these technologies, um, you know, for many, many quantum systems today are very big, right? Whether superconducting with all the refrigeration or the optical tables or, or, or other things like that. Um, so many of the problems, I mean, Luke, that, that you describe with quantum, many of the photonics companies are very small, the laser providers and things like that. And to make these quantum devices more pervasive, they're going to have to be a lot smaller and a lot cheaper. We're going to need photonic integrated circuits, right? And if we don't get that, you know, let's face it, you're not going to put an optical table in the middle of a network, right? right. Uh, yeah. you know, you're going to need all, all those, those types of considerations. So when we at inflection and we do neutral atoms, um, <laughs> yeah, we're shining lasers at everything you can think of for every possible reason, right? Uh, lo lo lots of Lots of lasers here. So um, part of what we do when we speak with the government and funding agencies and, and investors and things like that is bring this to the forefront, right? That photonics technology will be critical for what we do. We are part of the supply chain. We do build these ultra high vacuum uh, glass cells, which um, we've come up with a name calling them atomic prisms. I'm just floating that out there. Good I name. think it's a pretty good name. I've seen them. So I think, you know, I have my, yeah. my full support. <laughs> but these two industries, so Luke, as, uh, just going back to you, you know, uh, are you in the photonics industry? Or are you in the quantum industry? Which one drives the requirements on which? I think many of us are going to have to have a foot in each camp um, to be successful. And in the same way of whether it's government investment or private investment, um, that's going to be um, really important, and that will help us survive through that, right? Become an essential part of the supply chain, whether we cross this valley or death or whatever. That's going to be very important. So let, let me let me pressure you a little bit more, Bob, if you don't mind. So um, uh, you know, you 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 said before, and you didn't flesh it out. I'd like I, I'd like you to do so if that's okay. Like you seem pretty confident on the quantum sensor side. Is that is that fair? Yes, in the long run. And can, that, and can, that, can successive quantum sensors, you know, be a savior, perhaps, for quantum technologies as a whole? Well, I, 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 there's a tremendous need for it. I, I mean, I mean, let's put it that way. I mean, uh, some of the sensors, frankly, it's kind of hard to explain why you need a few more decimal places of accuracy and things like this. Of the you sensors, go take it as a given. Yeah, I, I, I think of them gravimeters, quantum gravimeters measuring gravity. Um, there are commercial uses for that in, in resource discovery. Uh, you can you can justify to people about um, maybe you can tell, for example, a volcano is going to blow because the magma chambers are filling up. But then on the military side, you can start saying, hey, maybe we can locate a buried bunker in a particular area, right? And and yeah. things like this. So you can tell the story and justify the need. And all of these, you know, you can fit into military or government spending needs. They're not going to say, no, that's enough, because we do know our adversaries are actively working on this, right? And we can't be less accurate than they are. Um, quantum uh, radio frequency receivers are another area that, that's going to be really important, making better use, finer control over our use of the RF spectrum in different ways. Um, I, you know, If you look at a cell phone tower, you see these large boxes frequently. You see lots of things, horns and boxes and things like that. But the, the receivers are often, um, the size of the receiver is proportional to the wavelength. Of, of, of what you're you're actually receiving. Whereas the quantum receivers will be much smaller, they'll be the same size for any frequency and they'll be reprogrammable, reprogrammable. 
and things like this. So if you can have the military, for example, use far more frequencies um, in a much smaller footprint and a much less expensive, they'll become more pervasive. It just won't be the large battleships, right? And things like that and have that capability. Um, and of course, you know, we use RF constantly in terms of our, our, our Wi-Fi networks and, and cellular and, and, and things like this. So what I'm really saying is that there are identifiable real needs for these things that will improve what we do um, for society, but also from the military side. And that's where the money, the so-called non-dilutionary funding will come from. Whether or not it's computing, you know, they've, the government has supported computing for a very long time. And they will continue to do so through organizations, Mike, like yours, which takes a great, I love the combination, Mike, if, if I may say of your top-down view of the whole, how everything has to fit together and then going deep on each, each technology. We, we need that type of thing. So, so that's why I'm bullish. I'm not saying it's tomorrow. Um, however, you know, it may very well be that we see some real use from quantum sensors well before big enough error corrected quantum computers um, are available. Very great. And, and Mike, we only have a couple of minutes left. But let me let me ask you. You know, you you speak to people obviously in the Air Force up and down uh, the, the uh, up and down the command chain, and, and then you speak to other uh, other government agencies as well. Um, like, how how what would you advise um, uh, industry to do to make to avoid a quantum window? Like, how what, from your perspective, what are you telling them to do in order to survive? Yeah, so I, I think um, you know a couple of things were said there earlier. Uh, you know, I love the. the Photonics discussion, subject near and dear to my heart since my background in upstate New York, certainly. <laughs> you know, with AIM Photonics being a big, you know, government investment in manufacturing of photonics, but really taking things to, to where they need to be to be practical. You know, I think what we convey to companies and some of the, you know, bigger companies out there as well as, as, well as supply chains is to be realistic with your expectations, right? Uh, it, it only hurts everyone when you go somewhere and Things are way overblown or over projected. And, you know, everyone has to be in this together. Cooperation, I like to say, right? So th that's, you know, one of the things we really like to, to talk about. And, you know, knowing, you know, I can't say this enough, right, that it's a, a long haul here, right? It's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, but even when you get to 26.2 miles, that's really not the end, right? It's going to keep going, right? Just like the computing race is going today or AI is going, right? So I, I think those are the types of things we, we tell companies, right? And we talk, you know, honestly talk to companies every day talking about things. And um, the other thing is with companies, you know, don't be afraid to partner with the government, even if it's like in a Credo cooperative research and development agreement, we can help maybe de-risk some of the technologies, look at, you know, then companies can maybe learn, you know, more in depth, some of the Air Force requirements. I think that helps as well. Obviously, we can't partner with everyone, work with everyone. But, you know, just having those discussions is very valuable for both, both parties, the government, as well as, you know, the smaller startups. Great. And so, uh, you know, Brandon, we have about 30 seconds left. Um, uh, what, what are your thoughts as you, as you speak to government? What are you, what are you telling people? How do we avoid a quantum warfare? Oh, so uh, I, I did like Bob's perspective on uh, sensing will kind of uh, carry carry the day. Um, I, I think that really when we're talking quantum winter, we're, we're really talking about computing. The problem is, especially thinking some of these these other technologies carrying the day, uh, for instance, I, I have a, a colleague that was fond of pointing out that um, pick the uh, the market cap of any of these these startups in the quantum computing space, and it rivals or is larger than the entire atomic clock market. And arguably, atomic clocks are foundational to a lot of aspects in our society. And so solving key problems and sensing are just the scale is just so mismatched with sort of what the expectation is with computing. And so I think there really is, if, if industry uh, sort of loses faith, I, I think at least in computing, there, there is going, going to be a winter. And it's really hard to imagine, say, government replacing all of the funding levels uh, at the level of private industry. So I think it really becomes a question of um, if that happens, can you sort of, uh, you know, protect some of the knowledge and protect some of the spaces so that way you don't lose the lose the intelligence, you don't lose the knowledge and working in the space. And you can keep research going 
well enough that when things pick up again, you can you can sort of capitalize on it. Um, so I, I think that's kind of really uh, really kind of where you need to be at. So I, I I noticed one of the questions uh, someone mentioned uh, something to, to kind of wrap up. Uh, I think one of the things that could really save a lot of the days uh, uh, that uh, it might just be hopeful thinking is, can we find applications in the near term for these quantum computers? And that's something that we can do now. If the if for instance the government or you know private industry is also this is why private companies are spending on average a million dollars a year. They're essentially looking for that killer app, and it doesn't have to you know change everything. But if they can find something that makes, you know, for optimization, for instance, makes their logistics 1% more efficient, that could end up being a huge benefit for like a large organization, uh, whether it be a public organization or a private. So if we can find a few of these niche use cases, I think that that could could sort of avert things. So that's sort of the two perspectives. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead I yeah. wonder if we just have a little bit of time. <laughs> well, thank you. I just wanted to add something because I think you know this. Th this is a very nascent industry, um, and one of the one of the barriers that exists is if you want to get answers uh, um, in the in the sort of quantum systems realm. If you want to get answers, you have to go to low temperatures, and you've got to have at least uh, you spend a, a, a few million dollars of equipment. Right. And so you think about how do you broadly access all the brain power and ideas and the potential that exists across this uh, great nation. Right. Um, when and that's one of the barriers that I think, you know, at least uh, in, in many states, in some ways can be reduced. And one of the things we're working on here in Montana is and 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 I'm helping the work with the university is like, how do we create an entrepreneurial ecosystem here? where if you were an entrepreneur and you had an idea, all that equipment's available for you. You can get, you can get time on a dilution refrigerator. You can get time at Fort Kelvin. You've got, you can make measurements. There's qubits. You, you, you have a reference point. If you've got an idea you, 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 and you've, you've got a startup, there's some way to prove it out, right? If you don't have that, because sometimes I, I talk with entrepreneurs across the nation, I'm like, well, well how, do you, how do you get to low temperatures? And he's like, the answer is sometimes or too often, well, I've got a buddy in the in the physics department really late at night <laughs> and we go in there and we get work done. And that that shouldn't be the answer, right? And so the, if if um if uh if we can remove that barrier and call it test beds, right? Test beds across the nation. Anyway, that's one of the things that we're doing here in Montana. And I think it's gonna make a difference. I think we're gonna have many, many more startups just because you can test ideas at low temperatures. Yeah, and, and 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 I think you're absolutely right. I think we do start seeing some of these test beds grown up now in the government labs. AFRL uh, Rome just opened up like uh, some. And Mike, you'll correct me when I get it wrong, but you know, a a a sharing um, part right outside their gates, uh, mm -hmm. so that people come and, and and do stuff. So it's really mm -hmm. it's really great. So I apologize. We are we are over time. Um, I'd love to continue the conversation, Sorry, perhaps, uh, perhaps, perhaps perhaps offline. But uh, but for now, I'd like to uh, to thank uh, Carl Paganato for uh, for opening the session, and of course, to thank the other one of our esteemed panelists for a wonderful conversation. Um, we always appreciate feedback here at later um, on these Grand Challenge Power Hour events. Um, and also ideas for future topics. So um, uh, if you have any thoughts, comments, critiques, please send comments to either labs at MITRE.org or policy at MITRE.org. Um, one last reminder, if you haven't heard enough yet, MITRE is hiring. That is true. We are hiring. And so if you have thoughts on how you can solve uh, some of these great challenges that face our great nation, uh, be it quantum, which is, of course, the most important thing, or, or otherwise, um, uh, you know, anything that you heard about today, please do reach out to recruitinghelp.mitre.org for more information. Again, that's one word, recruitinghelp.mitre.org. Uh, and finally, uh, we hope you will join us for future events uh, continuing uh, this summer, topics and si timing to be announced um, in the near future. Um, if you register for this event, then you'll receive um, continued updates and registration information um, in the coming weeks for, uh, for, for future Power Hours. We'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today. We look forward to seeing you again. Have a great evening.